What's up everyone? Welcome back to another review of Ageless and Back Here. This time we're taking a look at Mank, directed by David Fincher, written by his father Jack Fincher. This movie stars Gary Oldman. The movie Mank is about Herman J. Mankiewicz, who is the co-writer of the film Citizen Kane. This is pretty much a biographical pick about Herman J. Mankiewicz. With me to talk about this movie is my sister, Christina. Hello. Okay. Mank is definitely not my favorite David Fincher movie. I can mm -hmm. honestly say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on par with The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, in which it's a movie that, from a visual standpoint, looks really, really good. Mm -hmm. From an acting standpoint, it's really well done. But it's the story and the pacing that makes this movie really just kind of flat and boring in a lot of, as in a lot of ways. Like, this is a slow-moving movie. And... <clears throat> So, most two-hour movies, you don't really feel the runtime because they can go at a brisk pace. Right. Like, a David Fincher movie, like, like, Gone, you, Girl. like, like Gone Girl and Zodiac. Those movies are long, but they go at such a good pace that you don't feel the weight of at that time. Right. Mank? You feel it dragging. Yeah, it feels like, it, this movie feels like it was going on for four hours. But I will say this though, I want to get the positives out of the way. This movie did have a lot of good things in it. Like the scenery for the one scenery, thing? The scenery, yes. This movie takes place from that 1930s to 1940s time period and Fincher captured that aesthetic beautifully. I am a sucker for period piece movies. <clears throat> it's also in black and white. Mm -hmm, which, is a nice, which is a nice little throwback to that era as well. <clears throat> and um, what, what, I was, what, I'm, what I'm getting at captured the aesthetic of the 1930s and 40s with mm -hmm. the wardrobe with right. the overall just design of the film uh to me i thought the cast of actors really did a good job at kind of mimicking that uh that way of acting in a lot of areas mm -hmm. i mean you also i mean when you watch the movie also you they're also doing the modern day acting as well right. um, but i think for the most part they the movie stayed within the time frame that it was that it was done in like from a wardrobe aspect it looked Fine. It looked immaculate. From an overall directing standpoint, I thought Fincher actually did a really good job at uh, kind of using some visual cues from the 30s and 40s. And he actually does a lot of uh, Orson Welles homages in this movie as well. Like there's this one scene where uh, where where uh, uh, where Mank is at this uh, political party, and mm -hmm. it's like a montage scene. It's very reminiscent of how Orson Welles was shooting the scene. With, 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 with like certain visual cues and stuff like that. So I thought that was actually really, really cool to get homages like that. And you can tell that Fincher really did his homework to try and mimic that sort of style and give this movie some uh, an authenticity, right. if you will. Uh, Gary Oldman, who played Mank, I thought they... Overall, I thought Gary Oldman did a brilliant job playing Mank. Yeah, he was did. really good in the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, the movie is, for the most part, it is sharply written. I mean, the actors deliver the dialogue with... Crisp, and even though so there are some scenes that are boring, I, I give the actors credit for for trying to make the dialogue feel lively. Yeah. Yeah. It's just this, it's just that what they're talking about is just not all that interesting. <laughs> I will say this, in the scenes where Mank is working on the Citizen Kane screenplay, I actually enjoyed those scenes the best. It's the scenes where we're seeing that are taking place 10 years before that is where I find to be not that engaging, which is his overall arrival into Hollywood mm -hmm. and him interacting with people like Louis B. Mayer and David O. Selznick. I mean, it's cool to see those interactions and see that happening, but I just found it to be uninteresting. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I thought that Orson Welles as a character, he was completely underutilized in this movie for my, for my taste. I think this movie would have been much more stronger if it just focused on Wells and Kane uh, and Well of Wells and Mank going through the struggles of trying to get Citizen Kane produced overall, as opposed to this non-linear broken narrative of like of uh, peppering in Mank's early time in Hollywood, juxtaposed with what's happening in the current time where he's doing the screenplay. I think if the movie had a more singular narrative, it would be much more interesting. That's how that's, that's how I feel personally. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, again. This movie does have some good things to it. The overall supporting cast I thought was fine. Uh, Tom Pelfrey, who played his brother Joe, mm -hmm. I thought he was fine in the role. I actually liked the chemistry that, that Oldman and Pelfrey had in, certain, in some certain scenes. 
uh, Amanda Seyfried. Uh, she plays a character called uh, Marion. I thought she was yeah. fine in the role as well. She had it. She actually had a nice. She actually looked like a Gloria Stewart from the nineteen forties, like that. Yeah. That that, uh, that just uh, old fashioned, very extravagant look to her. She looked great. She looked like she. She, she looks like she could fit in that. From aesthetic. the hair to the bottom. Oh yeah, and from the overall wardrobe as well. Uh, Charles Dance, who plays the character of uh, William Randolph Hearst, who is actually a character that inspired the Citizen Kane character. I thought Charles Dance did a fine job in the movie as well. So like, I got no complaints from the acting. I got no complaints from the cinematography, which is brilliant, or, or David uh, Fincher's overall direction of the movie and the story itself. It's just that the story is just, to me, it just wasn't really all that engaged. I found myself struggling to pay attention in a lot of areas. Oh, yeah. Uh, this movie... Do you want to explain it? Because I... I just get really irritated because it's like it's a, like a simple mistake. Well, okay, okay. So, to make to make it to make to make a long story short, in 1930, they Mank got goes, their timeline messed up. Yes. So in 1930, Mank goes to I think he, he goes like to a, meet a meeting a with David. O no, no, no. He goes to meet David O. Selznick, right? Okay. And yeah. they're talking about the the Hollywood studio system, mm -hmm. and oh, it's a throwaway line, but O. Selznick mentions that Universal Studios is known for making schlocky, low-budget horror movies like The Wolfman and Frankenstein. Now, Mind you. it's a throwaway way line, but what really grinded my gears was that this flashback takes place in 1930. Uh, Dracula and the Frank and Frankenstein came out in 1931, a year after this supposed scene took place, and The Wolfman didn't even come out until 1941. Not only that, Universal Studios Werewolf Picture was not made till 1935. So that entire throwaway line, when you put it in the context, makes absolutely no sense. And it makes me wonder, is this movie version of David O. Snell's like a clairvoyant? Can he see the future? Can he see the future? <laughs> how would you know what Universal is going to do 10 years from now? How do you even know that they're even considering doing a Frankenstein movie when, number one, Dracula came before Frankenstein in Universal Studios' movie lineup? I didn't like that line. It just, it just really irritated me, <laughs> and it really screwed up the whole timeline. In my, in my estimation, so like, so in this world, Frankenstein and Dracula came out in 1929. Okay, okay. Uh, before the scene even took place, the the only two major Universal mo horror movies that came out were The Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame with Lon Chaney Sr. Those movie pre those movies predate Dracula by at least uh, roughly fifteen years when you put them together. So yeah, that throwaway line to me was a complete paradoxic was completely paradoxical, stupid, and it's just really an oversight that could have easily been fixed. I know I ranted on uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a throwaway line of the movie, but it just really grinded my gears. I didn't like it at all. <clears throat> all right. What's your rating overall? Well, overall, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Like, it wasn't horrible. I did like it. Uh, I just, I, I'm going to put it on par with Benjamin Button. It's a movie that, from a technical standpoint, is good. Mm -hmm. And if you cut maybe 30 minutes from this movie, I think it would have been much better for it, to be honest with you. This That's a movie, running theme with him. This movie could have worked best as a 110-minute movie. Much, just cut out the fluff. Tighten up the pacing. and It would have had a much better flow. But by stretching it out to almost... Eight out of ten is a final grade. Uh, I think I'm inclined to agree about maybe seven point five, eight. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not as it's not it's not a bad movie. Yeah, by it's not, that's the only rating. It's not a bad movie. It's just when you compare it to movies like The Game, Seven, uh, Zodiac, Social Network, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, yeah. hell, even Fight Club, which I like, but I'm not that big of a fan of, especially lately. I consider this to be one of his more weaker works, mm -hmm. but I, but I will say this: I will, I will watch this before I watch Benjamin Button again. I say that much. As Benjamin Button is a movie that goes on way too long, and it shouldn't have to. <laughs> oh yeah, so those are our thoughts on Mank. Let us know yours in the comment sections down below. Like this video and subscribe, and I'll check you back next time for more.